position of a combat uh, leader of a small unit in a war like Vietnam, where you don't have news coverage and embedded reporters, what happens in the jungle stays in the jungle. And you're leading a group of young wild wolves, and you have to be the alpha wolf. We were so young, we were, and, we, and we were so full of ourselves. You know, we were going to go see the elephant. All the, quote, supply clerks coming out to issue us our gear came out on signal and they were wearing the ribbons. And every single one of those guys had a Purple Heart or, or two or three. And it sure helped us start to grow up fast. I believe the younger generation should know the many goods that, uh, the many good things that we did when we were in Vietnam. I was born on November 11th, Veterans Day, 1945 in Honolulu, that was the city. Mom and dad were married uh, back on Guam in November of 45 and then came to the States and I was born here in 1946. I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii on January 26, 1938. My father was born in Pagat Sanang in the Philippines. My mother's parents were from Japan. My mother uh, is Chinese and she descended from Chinese missionaries. Brilliant woman, by the time she was 21 she had a master's. My father joined the Navy in 1934, was captured uh, when the island fell to the Japanese in 41, and uh, POW through the war. My father was one of 15 children, 13 who survived. Uh, he was born and raised uh, here in Honolulu, and by the time he graduated in 1937, this diminutive man who was five foot five and 145 pounds had become the first All-American football player in the history of uh, the University of Hawaii. And he married the Chinese beauty queen who happened to be my mother. And I don't know how my mom and dad got together because the Japanese didn't like the Filipinos and the Filipinos didn't like the Japanese. But they got along together and here I am. The draft loomed uh, over everybody then. And they hadn't drafted a school teacher out of Michigan since the Second World War because education and school teaching was seen as an exempt uh, uh, vocation. However, uh, to my misfortune, my draft board was in Hawaii. So nine months after uh, my wife and I were married, uh, school was out. And I came home to find my wife crying at the top of the stairs at our, at our apartment building because there was a long envelope. And in the upper left-hand corner, it said the United States Selective Service Commission. So I drafted in 1968. Went to Vietnam in 1966. I was 28 years old just turning 20, 19 when I enlisted in the Marine Corps. On active duty from 1966 to 1970. I returned from Vietnam as a sergeant, went out as a Lance Corporal. And for those of us who are of draft age, the Vietnam War equaled potential death. Michigan was a border state and people fled. I think it was 1943 or 1944, the territorial governor uh, chose the uh, War Mother of the Year. In one of those years, the War Mother of the Year was Malina Kaulukukui, my grandmother. And she was War Mother of the Year because she had 12 children in service of the country. All nine boys and three girls were in service of the country. Pretty hard to go run across the border with that kind of a history. I was assigned to Detachment 1, 552nd Airborne Early Warning Wing. Uh, we were part of uh, McNamara's Big Eye Task Force. Uh, I was with the uh, 3rd Marine Division. Uh, Battery M, Mike Battery, 4th Battalion, 12th Marines, and Kilo Battery, 4th Battalion, 13th Marines. The 173rd had a jungle school for that week right. and then out to the field. And then immediately out to uh, Immediately out to the field. I was a radar crew chief. I was in charge of 12 air, uh, radar air crew members in the back. Usually we had about 21 personnel on board the aircraft, mm -hmm. two pilots two navigators, one radio operator, two engineers, two radar techs, and the rest remaining uh, radar crew. Ultimately assigned to a battery uh, as a uh, fire direction controlman. We compute the data, send it to the guns, the guns fire the weapons. And with the artillery, we were computing data all the time because we were either firing missions or we were working up the uh, harassment and interdiction fires for nighttime firing. So there's some 300 coordinates that would come in It'd take us about a half hour, hour to do the calculations on all of that. And we were like a family. In Hawaii, we refer to it as ohana, like a family. I was a platoon sergeant. 
we were not friends. I was focused on, uh, on getting my people out alive and getting them home. That was my only job. We participated in almost every operation anywhere north in that time frame, sir. Um, all of them. We noted every aircraft that took off from, uh, from North Vietnam and we provided intelligence information to our uh, allies. We also did uh, search and rescue uh, for Don aircraft. We provided uh, assistance to uh, our allied and friendly aircraft for returning to base. We also uh, provided them with vectors and directions to uh, the refueling aircraft. And we also gave them directions to the nearest friendly air bases. Maybe the first few months we were in the lowlands. So we jumped around in the rice paddies. And for the last half of my tour or more, we went into the jungle because the 3rd NVA Division, which was a large division, had moved back into the mountainous areas of our uh, area of operation. It rained four months, monsoon season, so you were wet constantly and your flesh rotted off and everything got infected. You lived wherever you lived, slept wherever you slept, patrol 12 hours, 12 hours a day, ambush every night. When Kantian got almost overrun in early January, early 67, uh, everybody took rounds that night. Um, all at the same time, that was a very well-coordinated planned attack. Um, they had massed their artillery and fired on all the bases at the same time. Uh, we returned counter-battery fire on the positions we, we could. They got into the wire that night, but we fired a couple thousand rounds that night. For my tour, there's no big battle. Uh, constant skirmishes. Given the type of operations we're in, run into some people, run into a half dozen VC, run into one and two. People shoot at us, find base camps. That's basically what we did. We, we acted as almost like recon teams. We flew, uh, would you believe, 500 feet off the water. The Navy vessels that were out there used to always think that uh, we were ships instead of airplanes. And the reason we did that was to provide better coverage for higher altitude aircraft. One mission, get a report from the FO that we got secondaries. That told us we were hitting our targets. You know, we were on target and we were hurting them. And they were shooting and the, their fire dropped off just as soon as that happened, right afterwards. And there was an, uh, um, an exultation that just went through all of us. When we were credited with uh, shooting down at two MiGs and uh, I think uh, the whole crews were very elated that we had, we had done some, some kind of good that, uh, that we never thought that we would. So every day you made it through, that's your best day. Because your worst day might be coming. And if you survive that entire day and you're in a safe place where you can have the evening meal and you can reflect on the fact I made it through another day. But now you gotta make it through the ambush night. I don't think there was ever a best day. The best day I ever had was when I found out that I was coming home. <laughs> when the plane took off from uh, Saigon, uh, people were subdued. You know, you always think your plane is going down the, uh, down the runway and they're gonna rocket the plane. You're just not gonna quite make it until we got out into international air. And then the flight attendant announced we have now left. We are now in international air and this huge roar went up of all the people going home and you know at that time champagne came out and everybody did what they did. And I think the only guy in that plane who was depressed was me. I who was qualified to take care of my people had left my people in the hands of less qualified people. I had left my platoon to the vagaries of war and I was not there to take care of them. And I was very sad. For the time that was there and I cannot um, say that it was only me, but it was partly me. And, and three good platoon sergeants, I did not have one man killed. Within the two months after I left, five of them died. We had a, a, a howitzer blow up, killed three guys. Um, we were firing uh, nighttime H&Is, harassment and addiction fires. And uh, anyway, one of those rounds went halfway up the tube and blew up. So that, you know, we lost three good guys. Two guys going home, one new guy. My chief, I was a E6 then, I was working in the operations and his nephew from Hawaii was in the army and had just arrived at Tansunut and he was 17 years old. 
he, we got introduced to him. And he was just a young fellow. Two days later, he was killed. This was my first time, quote, under fire. When the first round landed, we, you know, immediately woke us up because it was about two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, rolled off my cot into the hole, got my flak jacket and helmet on, ran to the FTC bunker, which was what we were supposed to do. Well, it wasn't a bunker at the time, it was the tent with, with, the, with the sandbags around it. And I remember leaning over the charts, plotting the targets, the canvas of the tent, because we had no overhead cover, just like, like a, um, a skin on a drummer, you know, yeah. the, the, the timpani effect of the, uh, the percussion effect of, the, of that wafting on us as we were plotting. When the rounds would come closer, we'd pull the charts off and jump down into the trench right outside the tent and then put them back up. On a personal level, sir, it was good to know that I could function, that, you know, I, I, I withstood the test, if you will. So I wrote home to Thanksgiving and I thanked my parents in a letter and said, thank you for raising me right, because you don't know what it's like to be in a position I'm at because I'm God. What I allow will happen. What I see can't happen, won't happen. Uh, we weren't thinking about fear or, or whatever about the enemy. All we did, we remember, was to accomplish our mission and do our job. The strength of that was, you know, feeling like you were part of something that was organized, had a sense of purpose, had a standard of conduct, an expectation of um, achievement or performance, and demanded that from you. And that was, that's not bad. I left Vietnam, Vietnam in the first week in June, 1970. And my wife picked me up, I was in my army uniform. Went to her home in Chicago. Christmas tree was still up because they had waited for Christmas for me. I had a four-year enlistment. I had been in country uh, a full 13 months at that point. But at that point, I was a sergeant, you know, battalion watch chief. Um, I had, you know, I was good at what I was doing. It made sense to stay because I could, I felt that I was doing the right thing. Um, so, so hence I extended. I came back in July 1968. Oh, I had an old Air Force chief that says, I really need you. <laughs> that experience, it helps cement your view of who you, who you are. And uh, some of the greatest leadership lessons I learned, I learned in Vietnam because there's so much risk involved. A lot of our personal sense of self is your job. And knowing that you did your job and did it well uh, adds to that. And um, so finding that was the best. In 1982, when the Vietnam Wall Memorial was dedicated, and I wondered what happened to my men, because I had not, we had not seen each other. I still had my platoon sergeant book, in the, and it was still in the same plastic bag. It was the bag for the battery for PRC-77 radio. And in there are the names, the hometowns, the next of kin, the blood type, and in some cases, the social security number. So in 1985, we had our first reunion, platoon reunion. I picked the middle of the, uh, Lafayette, Indiana was the middle of the country, and we went there to a Holiday Inn. To my surprise, 17 people showed up. And almost everyone that came said, I wasn't coming. My wife made me come. Or I called up Joe, who I kept in contact with, and we said, well, if you go, I'll go. And one guy came from California, told his wife, what are we gonna do for four days? And the first night he was there, he called her back. He said, four days, <laughs> not going to be enough. Yeah. From that time in 1985, I now have about 25, between 25 and 30 of my platoon members. We get together now every two years. Certainly with the Marine Corps, we feel more attachment to, you know, guys from our time frame or the Marine Corps as a whole and those loyalties to each other. Uh, even though some of the guys, like you said, might have, you know, done two years, three years, and four years, got out, and, you know, 40 years later, we come wandering back through the front gate looking for somebody that might have been in the old unit, you know, from that time frame. And the reason that's important is now we can be friends. And I'm still a platoon sergeant. I get the phone call from people that say, you know, 
Mark's having a hard time. He's got a divorce. He's depressed. Joe just lost his house in a fire. We got to go build him another house. Bill is, uh, is you know, an alcoholic and abusing drugs, and nobody can get him to go in a drug program. I've had wives who are about to become ex-wives call me and tell me that their man needs help, and the only person they're ever going to listen to is me. So over those probably four and a half decades, I've probably saved a few lives, or I've helped them save their own lives. Uh, because the healing that takes place and the, and the counseling that takes place is important. So I think that's the first thing you need to do. You need to find a way to keep these soldiers together with the people with whom they had the most intense relationship. Because they can care for each other like nobody else can. To see all the names on the wall and, and then especially to see some of your friends, you know, etched, names etched on the wall. I've taken some etches and I brought the etches back home to a lot of my uh, for our friends, you know, their wives, their families. I used to go there with a great sense of sadness. Uh, you know, my, my guys are on, some of my guys are on that wall. It's a permanent drought in, 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 in the river of ancestry. I had resolved uh, in my mind that I have to let go of some of the things that I've carried for so long. And so I wrote a letter to my guys who were killed. Uh, and I wrote them a letter saying, you know, I'll never forget you. But I've carried uh, the burden of not being there to keep you alive for four decades. And I have to let go of that. And after that, the next time I went to the wall, it was kind of like visiting the boys. And, and, I, and I wish for, for others who have experienced that, that they can get to that point.